would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you. That's the judge. You just missed, you just met Judge McHugh. Um, it's my pleasure to call to order the 59th meeting of the public meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission uh, on Thursday, March 21st, 2013, held in the wonderful facilities at Bristol Community College. And as our first order of business, I would like to uh, invite our host to uh, welcome us. And first, before you do that, let me say thank you very much. You've been great to help us set this up. Your people have been terrific. It's a wonderful facility, and we're glad to be here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everyone. It's our pleasure to host this great event. Uh, it's, it's part of a community college philosophy to make ourselves available for community events, and this is certainly an important topic. Um, <clears throat> Just a little commercial about Br Bristol Community College. We have uh, four, four locations, uh, Attleboro, New Bedford, Fall River, and Taunton. Uh, so this, this matter is uh, of some uh, great importance to us at Bristol Community College. We're the third largest of the 15 community colleges, and uh, we're very grateful that you selected uh, Bristol Community College to hold this meeting, a very important meeting. And uh, anything that you need, please let us know. And I uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your uh, for your gracious, uh, graciousness and let us speak here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, bring in President Sprague for, for uh, your uh, hospitality. Okay, um, we're gonna do a few uh, r other orders of business. This is our regular meeting. The commission meets uh, so far this year, has met once a week, uh, and we do a regular series of items. So we have a few other pieces of business before we get to the big business, which is how do we proceed in Region C, Southeastern Massachusetts. First item on the agenda then is approval of minutes. Commissioner McHugh. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I distributed to everybody yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, the minutes for our uh, last meeting in February, February 28th. Uh, so um, if there are no corrections or amendments or other uh, things that people think should be in there, uh, I'd move that they be approved. Second. Commissioner, I have just a couple of uh, um, typos. typos, but I will make right. those available to you at, at a later time. All right. When those typos are corrected then, uh, they'll be inserted. Any other questions, issues? All in favor, accepting. Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimously accepted. All Next. Right. Are you doing the other minutes as well? No, that's what we have for minutes oh, that was the today, okay. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes come a long way for only one set of minutes. Well, yes, I know, but we have some other things we can fill the time with, I'm sure. Um, next item on our agenda is public education and information. That's an important part of what we've been doing. When the commission first set up, we established that we wanted to make this process a process that would be in fact and in appearance participatory, transparent, and fair. Uh, our, our mission, we feel, is that if we can persuade the people of Massachusetts and the applicants and the parties involved in this process, that the process is indeed participatory, transparent, and fair, um, then we will have the maximum opportunity to have you all have confidence in our decisions. Um, so the, the integrity of this process and the transparency of the process is our highest priority. A big part of that has big has been this topic on the agenda, public education and information. And uh, we have an ombudsman who works full time with us, who, uh, whose job it is to facilitate relationships with communities who might have a casino in them or a, a gaming facility in them or near them, uh, and to work with the operators as they interface back and forth with the communities, with the, the casino operators as they work back and forth with the communities. So, Ombudsman Ziemba, do you have anything to report to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my only item today is a follow-up to last week's meeting. Um, as you know, we had a discussion regarding how regional planning agencies could provide assistance on issues related to which communities may uh, experience impacts as a result of uh, the, the placement of a gaming facility in a region. Uh, we have reached out to all of the, to nine of the 11 existing applicants uh, to determine whether or not they will be interested in utilizing this service that uh, was, was voted on last week. Um, the two 
uh, that were not uh, reached out to our one, one facility has not indicated a site and the other facility just recently indicated a site and we're working on arrangements on how regional planning services could be arranged uh, within those communities. Uh, we've given each of the applicants about a week to get back to us to express their level of interest and in whether or not they want to take advantage of this service that we are that we uh, that we have created and um, hopefully I'll have more to report next week. I do have a question about this. Um, one of the uh, uh, RPA, this is the regional planning authorities, the, re the RPA directors called me on the way down here and he was under the impression that if a surrounding community or potential surrounding community does not <coughs> participate in the RPA process that the so that community would not have access to any monies to help them assess mitigation or negotiate with the operator. That is incorrect, correct? Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. This is a voluntary process for both regional, uh, excuse me, for applicants and also for communities. So communities have uh, uh, multiple options in how, we, in how they should go about getting assistance and evaluating impacts. And one of those is to reach out directly to applicants and on a voluntary <laughs> basis, the applicant uh, and, the, and the community will reach an agreement on the level of technical assistance that need, needs to be afforded to that community. Uh, and then the other uh, option is uh, involuntary disbursements. Uh, a few weeks ago, <laughs> the commission, as you know, uh, voted on a draft policy to uh, enable communities to, uh, to get funding for technical assistance even in the absence of an agreement from an applicant. Right. Uh, there's a certain showing that they have to make to the commission at that point and it is uh, time so that it is uh, so that we can encourage conversations between applicants and communities. <laughs> but no, th th that's not correct. Right. That I don't know. This was, this was the uh, ED of MAPC and I don't know how we got that impression. Um, but um, we should go back and fix that. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Anything else for our ombudsman? Thank you, John. Um, we are in the process of writing the regulations which will underpin uh, both the licensing process and the regulatory process once we get these, these uh, casinos and slots parlor licensed. Uh, there are pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of regulations to be written, to be reviewed, to be talked about with the public. Um, and we are just going to get a quick update, I think, on the status of the regulations from Commissioner McHugh. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we uh, are in the final stages of readying the regulations for the formal approval process. Uh, the Commission, as you know, is meeting on Monday for a public meeting at which we will take a look at the draft regulations, the final look at the draft regulations as a body. The staff has been working diligently to prepare them and the different drafts have been circulated, but we haven't had a group a meeting and I haven't had a public meeting to a look at them. So we'll have that on Monday. At the same time, we'll finish uh, the um, discussion that we started uh, two weeks ago at a public meeting about the evaluation criteria we're going to use. We'll finish that discussion on Monday um, and then begin to discuss a little bit the flow process for when we get the, uh, when we get the uh, applications. <clears throat> Our plan then is to have those regulations uh, put in the formal process for approval beginning on uh, Friday, uh, the 29th. Uh, that process will include uh, periods of public comment. They'll be available on our website uh, no later than next Monday, a week from next Monday. Um, there will be a public hearing uh, on the uh, regulations. We have to uh, see if we can do something similar uh, to what we did the last time. A period of public comment. Uh, then we'll assemble all the public comments uh, look at them, look at the regulations in light of those public comments, make adjustments to them, and they'll be promulgated by no later than June 7th, uh, which is when we anticipate the phase two site-specific applications will be ready for dissemination. So that's the, that's the plan that we're on. Okay, great. <clears throat> And that's a Monday afternoon, mon this coming Monday at, at Coming Monday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Right. That meeting, uh, like all of our other meetings, will be uh, streamed live on our website uh, so that anybody who's interested in attending uh, can. Anybody who's interested in hearing what goes on can look at the website. It will not be a meeting like this where we take public comment. That'll come later. Uh, but there will be an opportunity for public comment and a period when people will have the draft regulations available so that they can make uh, uh, thoughtful comments as they usually do. Great. Thank you. Um, the last item before we get to the Region C, the Southeastern Mass discussion, is a very important one. 
any of you who have heard me speak around the state over the course of the last year have heard me say that the legislation that the legislature and the governor passed uh, giving us the tools to do expanded gaming in Massachusetts was very, very fine job of uh, writing and passing legislation. Other regulators across the country tell us that they wish they had our statute to operate under. The legislature took a long time and did this very, very well. One of the things that they did singularly well is, alloc is assign us a mandate to do a very, very comprehensive research project on the socioeconomic impacts of introducing expanded gaming into the Commonwealth and into various regions of the Commonwealth. We are mandated to do a comprehensive baseline study of the pre-existing conditions before the casinos or the slots parlor opens so that we know the, what the status of problem gambling is before we do this. We know what the status of crime is. We know what the status of property values are. We know what the incidence of domestic violence is. We know what traffic patterns are. A comprehensive baseline study. And then once we introduce the casinos in the slots parlor, we will repeat that study and be able to track forever what happens when we make these, when we introduce these facilities and what happens when we try to moderate the problems. If we see traffic problems that were not anticipated, if we see problem gambling that, we're, that is, ex is expanding, we design intervention strategies and the research project will help us track whether or not we're doing our job to mitigate the negative aspects of this. Out of this research project will come probably, I would say certainly, the most rich and comprehensive study ever done on the socio and economic impacts of the introduction of gambling, uh, expanded gambling, into a new jurisdiction. Something that uh, the legislature did. It's not us doing it, it's the legislature doing it. We have been in the process of uh, executing a search process, an, an RFP, a request for proposal process, to get the vendor to do this multi-million dollar, many year long job for us. Uh, and Commissioner Enrique Zuniga has been the project manager, and I pass the ball to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have uh, submitted a, um, a memorandum describing the process that we have undertaking, undertaken up until this point uh, that started uh, relative to the RFP that you just described and um, included uh, two other members of the procurement management team um, to provide recommendations to this commission relative to the vendors that responded to this RFP. I will um, attempt to quickly summarize it and we can, we can have some discussion if there's any questions. Um, but uh, this, this process started um, back when we received those, we issued the RFP in November of 2012. Um, responses were back to us on January 7th and um, we received four responses, very thoughtful responses, uh, narrowed the field down to effectively two, and um, have really, um, I will say, struggled a little bit relative to really evaluating those, those two. These, these, these two um, groups are very um, capable, um, really multidisciplinary, uh, we expanded uh, perhaps a little the scope of what's in the legislation to include not just social impacts but economic impacts and the responses were very thoughtful and, and very well prepared. Um, we, um, as part of the review process, we realized that their methodology is slightly uh, or importantly, in important ways, it's, it's different the unit of, of analysis, uh, which we did not really anticipate when we started this RFP, um, because we did not dictate what that analysis would be, um, is, is different. Um, that difference, in, in my view, has um, different repercussions. Uh, first, perhaps a little bit on cost, but also, um, importantly, on what the analysis will eventually be. Um, that's what I tried to describe here in this memo. I can take any questions or have any comments relative to, um, to that, uh, those differences. 
Um, but uh, we have effectively a split recommendation. Uh, in, 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 in some ways, um, perhaps due to these differences from the procurement management team relative to um, one of those vendors. Well, are you going to make a recommendation? Or? I mean, the, 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 difference, the, the difference in Commissioner Zuniga's memo was, I think, well explained and it's very significant. One bidder, um, Cambridge Health Alliance, uh, basically wanted to take a study, a large study of 6,000 people and take, do a baseline study of those 6,000 people. This was a major part of their project, not the whole project. Take 6,000 people and study those people forever. It, even if they moved out of Massachusetts, continue to happen to see what happens to a cohort of people, 6,000 people, when expanded gaming is introduced. It's an extraordinarily interesting study and will get tremendous amount of information about what happens to those people. The other group, which is headquartered at University of Massachusetts Amherst, had a 17,000 sample, and their job was to take a snapshot of, of, of th those people representing the whole population of Massachusetts, and then would replicate that same sample, but with different people, um, several, every time, every few years, so that they could study what happened to a community, not what happened to a cohort of people. Um, the people will leave Massachusetts, and we don't care what happens to them from the standpoint of what's going on in Massachusetts. So that was a very big distinction. Um, there's also a difference in the sample size. A 17,000 sample is a huge sample. But when you're trying to study small groups, you know, what, what happens with Native American uh, population when you introduce, you know, what happens with the incidence of problem gambling in a small population where problem gambling is a small segment of the population, you need a big enough sample that you can look at small segments of the community, small geographic regions, small demographic groups. So having a sample size that big is a phenomenal analytic tool to, to track different aspects of the community. So those, those um, understandings of the their understanding of what kind of an, an, an analytic tool we needed and a survey approach we needed uh, was very important to us, that they really got it uh, in a way that was much closer to what the legislation needed and wanted and mandated than, uh, than the other proposal. And, and I should add that um, this, is, this is a central component to their proposal for, for both and a central uh, distinction. Uh, but both proposals are certainly very uh, much comprehensive. There is, there is and any, excellent. any, uh, an excellent, and there is very, um, very uh, important additional factors. Economic research, uh, uh, economic researchers as part of their team. Uh, but this is a key distinction that that I think we're, we're highlighting um, appropriately. Um, and there's one other key distinction. Right. Right. Well, the, 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 this has a cost, cost implication, and um, we, we took that into account um, when it comes to uh, our analysis and, and, and scoring. Um, there, um, the, the, the difference is, is about, you know, a million dollars more for, for the... Right. Um, it's, a, it's, a hundred, it's a million two. It's about a 20% um, uh, difference uh, when, it, when it comes to... Um, uh, to the cohort versus the cross-sectional uh, survey. But um, um, the difference is not all attributable to the, to, 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 the, um, um, to the survey necessarily. Um, there's, there's important differences, one of which is overhead, for example, as you, as you can right. Commissioner, I, yep. the key points that I took from your memo, and just let me know if I'm uh, if I'm summarizing, and this is what was uh, important to me, was at the end of the process, there was a virtual tie with these two respondents. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then I think the reason this recommendation is being made is, is you summarized very well in the last paragraph, which is, um, you know, better, uh, better informed programs target specific population subgroups. Uh, it's information that um, service administrators will need, and, and those are clearly articulated in the Gaming Act. Correct. So, so you think this 
respondent better fits the responsibility that we have to, to meet the uh, responsive to meet those goals from the act correct that's that's what we believe uh, mm -hmm. it's it's comparatively uh, mm -hmm. again it's um, that's not to say that the, the other respondent does not do a good job at, at, at um, covering a lot of those goals but uh, what we believe is that the, a cross-sectional approach mm -hmm. would would be uh, in a better position, uh, would, would have uh, uh, not just this commission, but uh, service providers uh, be better informed as to how to target design uh, ser uh, services, uh, which is ultimately what we believe a central point yeah. to the mandate of research. Uh, it's not necessarily just uh, doing research as, uh, from an academic standpoint. It's Usable one data. to be using. Right. Yeah. That was persuasive to me. Uh, I thought the memorandum you prepared was uh, thoughtful, as it, uh, all your memoranda are. It was uh, uh, well uh, thought out. It was, uh, it was, um, uh, and, the pro and the process was a rigorous uh, one. Uh, but this is the um, biggest uh, commitment we're making thus far. It is a, 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 a um, issue that is of significant importance to the Commonwealth and to all of us. Everybody is is committed to having a first-line um, uh, set of research uh, 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 prepared. It is a, um, uh, a process in which there, the two uh, uh, finalists were uh, 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 closely tied in, the, in whatever scoring system was, was used. And it um, is a, a, a process um, that is going to go on for some period of time, and as to which the project um, team was divided as to which was the best. I understand the distinctions between the two and the judgments that were made, but uh, given the magnitude of this and given the um, importance of it, uh, I would uh, like to have a presentation by the two finalists within the next week or so, so that we all could uh, take a look at uh, not only the proposal that they made, uh, but also ask them uh, some questions about um, the kinds of things that you talked about in the memoranda and uh, the judgments that uh, have tentatively been made. I, I, I know that you've been at work, and it's not because of a doubt as to the uh, thoroughness or the thoughtfulness of the approach that's been taken, but when, when something is this close, and this important and this expensive, uh, I would uh, like, as one commissioner, to uh, spend a few more minutes uh, with it at a meeting where we talk to the proponents themselves. And uh, so I, that's that's what I'd like to do. Other, Commissioner oh, Stevens, you have a reaction? You know, one of the distinctions I saw between in your memo about the two proposals is one might be more more directly focused on some of the economic data and information that we would be pulling out as opposed to the other which uh, tended to focus more on some of the social data we might collect. Um, so if you can share with me how that may have weighed into your decision one way or the other, but uh, I'm curious also to get your thoughts on Commissioner McHugh's recommendation. Well, this is this is certainly something that is is, is very much in, in um, you know at the discretion of, of all five of us. Um, I, um, I relative to the economic piece, I, I believe um, not unlike uh, what what we talked about in terms of social impacts, the um, the the economic uh, team or the the economic piece was stronger on the other on the other team perhaps a little bit more comparatively um, it's it's hard to quantify just just how much um, but um, these um, we I, I can I can speak from my experience um, I read these I, I write I wrote the RFP mostly with the help of a few others but um, I read the responses very thoughtfully. I went through, uh, you know, talking about them, and, and my understanding of 
the nuances and what's really behind here evolved as I, as I went through that process. And, and to some degree, I tried to capture that in, in the memo, but um, your, um, your suggestion about having, presenting, uh, having these uh, uh, teams come present to this commission as a whole, I, I think is a good one. Uh, it could enrich um, the understanding of, of I don't, I don't quite agree with that, oddly enough, in this situation. I'm certainly happy to go either way, but the, these proposals are so long and so dense and so complicated. We, we, the, the, the project management team, and I sat in on a number of these conversations, not all of them, uh, the project management team spent hours uh, talking about these with two people who are experts in the two fields, research and problem gaming. We, and they couldn't come to a, they, they, it was so, dense that they eventually had to hire an outside consultant who was a really professional researcher to help w work their way through that stuff. Um, and I would be concerned that if somebody, somebody might come in and people make a presentation and you know, look good in the presentation, but we'd never have an opportunity to get to the level of depth and analysis that w is required to do this. and um, it, it might, somebody might look terrible or somebody might look good and cause us to make a decision which is really not the best decision. This is one case where I think actually we've been, we're better served, and I don't think this is very often the case, um, we're better served by uh, outsourcing the judgment to a substantial extent to um, other folks. Um, but I'm, I'm, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't fight it, that's just my, that's my sense. I agree with the chair. I, I see the work that went into this with experts, and I, um, I know that I would not be willing to listen to one presentation and feel like I had a better understanding than the team did. Just sitting here and thinking about it, I, 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 I would welcome the approach. My, my concern is, obviously, we're talking about right now here at this meeting selecting one team over the other, and I'm not sure if I was the other team how anxious I would to be sh to show up knowing that there's a recommendation on the table. Having the UMass team come in and maybe make a presentation giving us a chance to ask more in-depth questions as we may have them might be helpful, but uh, uh, sitting here and thinking about it, I'm not sure if I was the other, the other candidate or the other bidder that I'd be interested in coming in at this point. Well, I, I was talking about both. I wasn't talking about just having the, the, the one that was picked here come in. And I, I understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, what you've said, but in the last analysis, that means that we're uh, not capable of making an intelligent decision. And that's um, a um, conclusion uh, I am not... Uh, 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 well, it's not willing to it's, accept. It's a, it's a matter of efficiency. You know, we, we have, we have um, delegated the dramatic lead on many of our hiring decisions to a commissioner. And in, in, I think in not every, maybe if not every case, most cases, the commissioner has made it, w along with the help of an outside uh, search team and assessment team and a very rigorous search process, that one commissioner has pretty much made the decision by recommending to us who we should hire for our major positions. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's no reflection, it's not that we can't do it, it's this, that in order to make an informed decision, we have to split ourselves up in order to parcel out the responsibilities so we can get everything done. Uh, and the team that's been assigned this has had been able to take the time to really vet it properly. And maybe I, I should add that um, to, to a great extent, um, we, we could not go wrong with either one of these teams. Well, that's um, true. They're, they're, you know, even our, uh, the peer reviewer that we used uh, confirmed that you know, from, from the, from the, the get-go. The peer reviewer referred to them both as dream teams. Dream teams, right. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I may be arguing both sides here, but um, th these, these um, this decision is very important relative to um, the, the, what we do up front really lays the foundation to the ongoing or recurring piece of this research. So um, I, I, I wouldn't want it to be um, doubtful or, or, or misunderstood. 
Just, just one more thought, Mr. Chairman. You raised the, uh, uh, the suggestion that when we have had, when we've served as uh, hiring managers, we've always had those final candidates come in front of the five of us. Um, you know, I think, I think it certainly would be worth our time. I, and again, the recommendation here is for uh, Commissioner Zuniga to begin the further process of refining the scope of work and undertaking a contract negotiation. But uh, in terms of us taking a vote on a final selection, I think having UMass come in and make a final presentation, all five of us, would be similar to how we've conducted some of our, you know, hiring, uh, hiring uh, decisions. That's actually not a bad idea. Would that, um, we could, this is not to contract with one vendor. This is to authorize Commissioner Zuniga to begin to negotiate uh, with one vendor. Um, we could have that vendor come in, as you said, even as the process begins, and, and make a pre presentation, talk about these issues as much as possible. And if there is lingering concern, you know, this is a big enough decision that as desperately as I feel the pressure for time to get moving on this, I don't want to railroad this one through. But would that work for you, Commissioner McHugh, if they came in and then we don't make a final commitment, we hear from them and then see how everybody feels at the end of that? Uh, I would prefer that. That's a step in the direction of, I, I, I would prefer that. Well, it's, it's, it sounds like maybe that's sort of the, the, the preferred middle ground. Um, and I think without, unless somebody wants to take a vote on this, I think we sort of talked ourselves to a strategy, if, if you're comfortable with that. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's, Thank you. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, it, it is a, it's a very tough decision, and, you know, the, the, the inexpensive contract is a $4.5 million contract, and, and the, so this, we're talking serious money, and, and this is not one we want to make lightly. So um, let's proceed on that and try to get them in next week, I even will. as you begin talking. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I guess we are adopting your motion subject to them coming in not executing anything. We're adopting your motion, so we need to do that, subject to them coming in next week. All right? Sure. Do you want me to read that for the record? Yeah, why don't you? So add, I add in them coming in wait. for final approval. Sure. So I will move that uh, the Gaming Commission authorize me, uh, Enrique Zuniga, to begin the process of further refining the scope of work and undertake contract negotiation with the team of UMass Amherst uh, as part of the response to the research RFP, subject to their presentation, their further presentation about scope to this commission. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Okay, thank, thank you. you folks for your um, patience with us. We are now to the major item on our agenda, which is this discussion about how to proceed uh, in southeastern Mass in the business of uh, seeing whether we can't one way or another get a expanded gaming facility here. Um, just a couple of introductory comments. Uh, this is an issue that we take very, very seriously. Um, as I said, we are committed to a process which is participatory, transparent, and fair. Uh, this is a situation where there are conflicting interests the legislation that we operate under recognized those conflicting interests, made an attempt to give us some tools to reconcile them. Um, we know that there are strong interests, strong rights, strong economic impacts, strong emotions on many sides of this issue. Um, we, uh, we are going to take really seriously the one thing the legislature did not do was give us clear direction on how to proceed and has left it up to us uh, to figure out how to proceed. Um, and we're going to take that very seriously. There are two ways to participate in that decision thus far. One is to submit comments on our website. Many of you have, uh, and anybody is invited to. We all read all of those, and we talk about them, and we take them very seriously, and we welcome them. And the second alternative thus far is to have signed up to speak here uh, by the end of the day yesterday. Um, at if you were a public official or if you were representative of one of the various groups involved in one way or another for this process. We have um, 15, I think, speakers. We are going to limit speakers, including the interchange with the commissioners, 
to 10 minutes apiece. I'm going to try pretty hard to stick to that because 150 times 10 is going to be three hours from now. Um, so we're going to have to stick to that. Uh, so please, when you're talking, take it seriously. Don't make me force uh, you to stop. Um, and I believe we are ready to strike, start with Cedric Cromwell, the Tribal Council Chair of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. Mr. Chairman, welcome. Chair, Chairman Crosby, Commissioners, Winniki Sakni Tupac. That means good day, my friends in Mashpee Wampanoag. I'm Cedric Cromwell, <coughs> Chairman of the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my tribe today. Joining us today are members of our tribal community. We have members of our tribal council, our elders, and many others who are working hard to build a better future for our tribal nation. As you know, the Wampanoag people have inhabited this era for more than 12,000 years. Roughly 400 years ago, our ancestors greeted the first explorers from Europe. We welcomed the pilgrims and helped them to survive the first harsh winters here. Without enumerating the many injustices brought upon our people, our existence today is a reflection of the ter determination and perseverance that has taken for our people to remain and survive in our homelands. As a federally recognized tribal government, today we have an obligation to providing housing, health care, education, and employment services to the members of our tribe and the members of other tribes who live in our Bronxville, Bristol, Norfolk, Plymouth, and Bristol, Bristol counties. To meet our obligations as a sovereign government, federal law has given us the right to pursue gaming as an economic development tool and to provide us with resources that we need to provide services to our people under our care. The Commonwealth fully recognized these rights with the passage of the Expanded Gaming Act. I'm here today to make it quite clear that it is unnecessary to open up Regency for commercial gaming license applications. While our legal counsel has informed you of the legal basis of this belief, I'm not here to discuss illegal matters with you today. I'm here to tell you that our project is on track, that in fact we have made historic and swift progress towards our land being taken into trust by the Secretary of the Interior, that we are literally years ahead of any other project in the Commonwealth, and that we are poised to bring thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars in economic growth to southeastern Massachusetts in the very near future. We have systematically worked to meet every condition to set forth in the expanded gaming law, as well as federal regulations governing tribal gaming. First, we have acquired land in an industrial park in Taunton where we will build a first-class destination resort casino. This land, along with land in Mashby, is under active review at the Department of Interior to become an initial reservation for our tribe. Second, the National Indian Gaming Commission has approved our Tribal Gaming Ordinance, and we have established a Tribal Gaming Commission that will govern our Tribal Gaming operations. Third, we have successfully negotiated an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Taunton to mitigate all impacts on that community. In addition to the millions of dollars in mitigation for needs like traffic improvements, public safety, and infrastructure, we will also pay the City of Taunton at least $8 million per year in revenue. Fourth, in June of last year, the voters of Taunton overwhelmingly supported a ballot question authorizing this project to move forward. Fifth, we have drafted an environmental impact statement under the National Environmental Protection Act supported by thousands of pages of detailed traffic environmental studies. Sixth, we have voluntarily participated in a full environmental evaluation under the Massachusetts Environmental Protection Act, ensuring that all residents of southeastern Massachusetts have ample opportunity to learn about the project. Seventh, on December 31st, 2012, Kevin Washburn, the Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, sent our tribe a letter announcing that our land in Taunton will qualify as an initial reservation under gaming regulatory act that's called IGRA, this means our tribe may conduct gaming on this land once it's taken into trust. We have provided the commission with a copy of this letter. In simple terms, this means that we have demonstrated to satisfaction of the federal government that the lands in Taunton, where we will have our casino, 
are part of our historic tribal lands, I note that numerous people who have tried to undermine our project have said that this is something we could never demonstrate. They were wrong. Eighth, just yesterday, Solicitor Hillary Tompkins from the Department of Interior, the lead lawyer at the Department of Interior, informed us that the department is making substantial progress in its active review of the tribe's Kachiri submission and considers the determination a top priority of the department. As we did with the report that demonstrated our historic ties, we have provided to the Interior Department with voluminous information establishing without a doubt that the tribe meets all applicable criteria. Based on the decisions made by the department for other tribes on the Kachiri issue, we believe that the department's decision will be favorable and this decision will be made very soon. So what does this mean? Put simply, it means we expect to put and have our land taken into trust by the Department of Interior this year. And that will have shovels in the ground by this time next year. And we will open for gaming by early 2015. Let me now turn to the compact. Governor Patrick and I signed a new compact this week, which will be sent to the legislator for approval. We are extremely grateful to the governor for his determination and not to let the disapproval of our compact last fall become an obstacle to, pro to our economic development plans. This time our compact has been drafted with full input from the Department of Interior, for which we are also grateful. On this agreement, once it's approved by the legislature and just submitted to the Department of Interior, we expect speedy approval. Given these circumstances, we believe that it would be unwise for the Commission to accept applications in non-refundable $400,000 fee from commercial applicants. The Expanded Gaming Act says that the Commission may not award a commercial license in Regency unless it is determined that the Secretary of the Department of Interior shall not take our land into trust. That's right. clearly the opposite of what is happening. We recognize that the rules related to tribal rights are unfamiliar to most people, but the Commission and the public should understand that if our plans to build and operate a casino under compact are derailed, the tribe will still build and operate a Class II Indian gaming casino in Taunton. In that event, we will not pay any revenue to the Commonwealth at all. However, despite our rights to proceed on our own, we have chosen to negotiate in good faith a compact with Governor Patrick because we wish to be partners with the Commonwealth in bringing economic growth to southeastern Massachusetts. Let me close by saying that as the Assistant Secretary has stated in his letter, the tribe is not involved in an indefinite process. We will have all decisions in place this year. This is simply no reason whatsoever for the Commission to open Regency for commercial applications. Katapa Tanamu, that means thank you to you all in my language. Thank you. Uh, questions for the Chairman? Uh, I, let, let me say that uh, our obligation is to reach out to uh, all uh, participants in this forum and in others, and in keeping with that, I talked to Secretary Washburn uh, about an hour and a half ago. We were trying to reach him, uh, and he finally, uh, we were able to make that connection uh, an hour and a half ago. And um, the essence of our conversation was uh, this, um, and, and we talked about really uh, three uh, topics. And number one, insofar as the um, compact was concerned, he said that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had provided both the Commonwealth and the tribe substantial technical assistance, um, uh, that their uh, policy is not to um, uh, 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 reject compacts if it's at all possible not to do that. And, and so they had in the hope that this one uh, will survive, provided substantial technical assistance to uh, both the state and the tribe. Uh, insofar as the Cartieri dis, uh, issue is concerned, uh, he said that, that that was in the solicitor's office. I should, uh, for everybody uh, to understand, the Cartieri decision is basically a, a decision of the Supreme Court of the United States that says that the only land that can be taken into trust under the statute 
is land of a tribe that was recognized in 1934 when the decision was passed. Under federal jurisdiction. Under fed, uh, was, was under federal jurisdiction at the time uh, the statute was passed. And uh, that's, uh, that gets into highly technical issues. And, and in any event, uh, that is in the solicitor's office. They are actively working on it. Um, but that will not be something that the Bureau of Indian Affairs will make a public announcement about. It is advice from the solicitor to the, to the uh, undersecretary or the assistant secretary and will be a part of the final decision, not a separate milestone along the way. And finally, uh, insofar as the land and trust was concerned, he said that that too is proceeding, that the environmental process that you talked about, uh, Mr. Chairman, takes time. Uh, there were no red flags uh, raised uh, thus far. And uh, at the same time, uh, he was unable to give me an estimate, even in a ballpark, as to when they would be finished or likely to be finished. Uh, so that was, in sum and substance, uh, what uh, Secretary Washburn said, uh, some uh, of which, uh, 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 nothing of which is inconsistent with, you, with what you said, to Mr. Chairman, uh, but uh, there were no commitments as to time. Uh, he did say, uh, as sort of an overall thought, that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, was um, uh, particularly um, uh, uh, pleased by the uh, relationship between the tribe and the Commonwealth and had uh, therefore uh, viewed this uh, process uh, as uh, in, a, uh, I think, special category were the words that, that he used, uh, but I'm, uh, I can't be quoted on that because I may not be precisely repeating what he said. Uh, uh, so that was, that was the essence of, of what uh, uh, Secretary Washburn said an hour and a half ago. Good going, thank you. Any questions for the chairman? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Have a thank good day. You. Thank you. Yeah. Let me just clarify one thing, uh, Commissioner McHugh. The land and trust decision is not contingent upon the NEPA process, is it or is it? It is. Uh, yeah. that is. That is part of that process. So uh, the land and trust award cannot be made until there is a con successful conclusion of, of, the, the, of the NEPA process. That's, he, he and I talked about that, and I said we're in a, we're in a different uh, position here than in, in that uh, we, uh, he, he said that you are going to have to go through, and your uh, commercial uh, uh, licensees are going to have to go through an initial uh, environmental review as well. And I said yes, but in all likelihood we award the, the license subject of successfully passing that, uh, which is different from your uh, process. Uh, and he confirmed that it is different. Okay. Okay, uh, next on our list is uh, Representative Robert Cassera from the 11th Bristol District. Representative, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the commission. Welcome to uh, South Coast. To <coughs> southeastern Mass, or as you might be familiar with it, Region C. Uh, my remarks will be relatively brief, and I welcome any discourse or, or questions or, or comments that you may care to make. The Massachusetts Gaming Commission, without further delay, should vote today to issue a request for applications for a commercial casino license in Region C. <coughs> delay in issuing a Category 1 license in Region C is costing the Commonwealth revenue and the region jobs. The time frame noted in Chapter 194 of the Acts of 2011 for Indian gaming preference in Massachusetts has passed. The compact negotiated by the Commonwealth and the tribe has been rejected by the federal government. The tribe faces insurmountable obstacles to getting land placed in trust by the federal government under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act due to the 2009 Karcheri Supreme Court decision. The 2009 Supreme Court decision prevents the federal government from taking land in trust for tribes that were not federally recognized when the Indian Reorganization Act was passed in, and became law in 1934. The Mashpee Wampanoag tribe did not receive federal recognition until 2007. The land in trust issue effectively prevents them from opening a casino in Massachusetts within a reasonably suitable period of time. 
We are not talking about tribal game, gaming occurring months or even a year after the other two regions opened their commercial casinos. We are talking decades after the commercial casinos are open in Massachusetts. The Gaming Commission cannot afford to wait months and years from today to revisit a commercial license for Region C. The Commission must act today to ensure that Region C will derive the same benefits from casino gaming as the other two regions of the state. The lack of congressional action on the federal land and trust issue increases the likelihood of lengthy <coughs> litigation of this issue should the federal administration, i.e. the Obama administration, place the Wampanoag land in trust. An example being the Cowlitz tribe of Washington state, which is in litigation on this issue since the federal administration, the Obama administration, placed the land in trust in 2009. There is an expectation that the Massachusetts Gaming Commission shall act timely on the issuance of a Category 1 licenses in the Commonwealth for all three regions. Time represents money and jobs for the Commonwealth and its citizens. The legislation clearly calls for three regional destination resort casinos. The Commission should not disadvantage Region C for good intentions. We need the revenue. We need the jobs. Today, the Massachusetts Labor Office will release unemployment figures for the month of February. The January figures, however, are telling of the jobs need in Region C. While the statewide unemployment rate is 6.7 percent, the New Bedford unemployment rate is 14.2 percent. The Fall River unemployment rate is 14.9 percent and the city of Taunton's unemployment rate is 8.1 percent. Region C unemployment is chronically higher than the statewide average and is well above the figures for Suffolk County, which is 6.9 percent where Boston is located, and Hamden County, which is 9.5 percent where Springfield is located. Given the obstacles of the United States Supreme Court decision, it is just plain wrong to reasonably expect a timely resolution to the land and trust issue for the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe of Massachusetts. I urge this commission to take action today by voting to request applications for the Category 1 license in Region C. I clearly see it as an uh, issue of um, equal treatment for all three regions of the state. And um, in my opinion, I believe the need is greatest for economic development in Region C. We've been devastated by the loss of industry. If you travel through the city of Fall River and Taunton and New Bedford, you'll see vacant mill buildings or you hear of buildings that were destroyed by fires because they're no longer employing people. Uh, we're a gateway city. We have all the, all three are gateway cities. We have all the problems associated with urban America. We need the jobs. And I would be the first to argue for exclusivity for federally recognized tribes in Massachusetts if I felt that there was a reasonable expectation that those jobs would come into being and the state would derive the revenue from it. But a Supreme Court decision, no review, no decision by an administration, Bush, Obama, or any ones to follow, can reinterpret or override the Supreme Law of the Land, which is a Supreme Court decision. So I would submit to you that to go and say, well, we're going to wait because they're showing progress on the compact uh, and, oh, the administration will take it into trust is, um, is doing a great disservice to the region that I'm proud and have been proud to represent for the last 25 years because we're suffering. We're hurting economically. When, and I'll close on this. When Governor, Dukak, uh, Governor um, Patrick first proposed casino gaming, not that you need to know this, but when he first proposed it in 09, <coughs> he saw it as urban economic development. 
the issue there was on whether slot facilities would be given only to racetracks. It was defeated because of legislative leaders that were absolutely against. When it came back in two years, there was a change in legislative leadership, and the parameters that we operated under were, were twofold. One, that the slot facility would be competitively bid. Okay, we, we, we agreed to that. And the third was a carve-out, Indian uh, preference, uh, for this region. And uh, we could not vote for that without those criteria in place, so we did. Otherwise, he would have vetoed it, and we would not have the votes. In the legislature today, there are those who feel that two is better than three, and none is best of all. They're just opposed to gambling and the expansion of gambling in the Commonwealth. And so they will see an opportunity to um, vote to accept a, a further compact. I mean, this, this process never ends. You could, you could be here 10 and 20 years with successors basically saying, well, we're going to wait. We're going to give them a second bite, a third bite, a fourth bite uh, before they get this right. The people in southeastern Mass can't wait that long. And that's the only point that I want to get across to you. I thank you for your time. And I do thank you for, um, as, as non-elected but public officials nevertheless, taking the, uh, making the effort to come out from beyond Boston and come out from beyond 128 and even beyond 495. Some people in Boston have called uh, areas beyond 495 the end of the universe. Clearly it's not. So we thank you for your presence here and uh, we thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any questions for the Representative? Representative, thank you very much. I, I do have a question. Yes. Uh, do, do you have uh, any sense, uh, we have a compact now, it has to be approved or put to a vote before the uh, legislature. Do you have any sense as to when the legislature is likely to take this up? I, I don't. Uh, I do know that Speaker DeLeo made a uh, comment in Merrimack uh, yesterday or, or today to the effect that, that he thought that with the first compact having passed, that um, you collectively would be making a, a decision to move forward on the, um, on the issuance of applications. I don't know if I took a copy of that to have it with me to accurately. Uh, it's all right. We, That's can, right. we can find we can, it. We can uh, look it up. Representative. It Thank was you. in the State House News Service, right. and I believe it was yesterday or today. I don't okay. believe I have it with me. Right. I do have written copies of my remarks if you care to. Um, yeah, it would be great. That would be helpful. Okay, just, I'll leave them with you. Just one is plenty. Thanks. Um, you did say one thing. I do want to clarify. I should have said this at the beginning. Uh, you said you hoped we would vote today. Uh, we will not be taking a vote today. What we're here to do is to listen and to learn, um, to see whether there are other issues that we need to learn more about. We will then take this under advisement for as short a time as possible. Um, and we will then, at a subsequent meeting, a week or two or possibly three weeks from now, we will get back to this and make a final decision. Okay. Thank you Thank again. You. Thank you. Representative Keiko Oral from the 12th Bristol. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. I represent the 12th Bristol, and it's the district that includes the proposed tribal casino. And I, I represent the communities of Lakeville, Berkeley, parts of Middleborough, parts of Taunton, including East Taunton and 3B. The communities in the 12th Bristol continue to be concerned about mitigation funds for towns surrounding the tribal ca casino proposed for East Taunton. The renegotiated tribal state compact includes mitigation for surrounding <coughs> communities, but it has not been determined if this amount will be sufficient to meet their needs, as prior studies to this compact were not conducted. Several officials in the region believe that the issues associated with the resort casino will be significant and to varying degrees will impact their public safety roads and schools. In part 12.2 of the Tribal State Compact, it states that the Massachusetts Gaming Commission 
will expend monies from its community mitigation fund to assist communities to offset costs related to the construction and operation of a gaming establishment, included but not limited to the impacts on communities and water and sewer districts in the vicinity of the facility, local and regional education, transportation, infrastructure, housing, environmental issues, and public safety, including the office of the county district attorney, police, fire, and emergency services. The Massachusetts Gaming Commission may, at its discretion, distribute funds to a governmental entity or district other than a single municipality in order to implement a mitigation measure that affects more than one municipality. It is not clear to me how the Massachusetts Gaming Commission will make its determination as to what communities will receive mitigation and what amounts will be allocated. The concern remains as to how this will be determined equitably without the necessary studies having been done prior. In the Gaming Commission meeting minutes from December 4, 2012, Commissioner McHugh stated that there were several obstacles that remain in order for the Mashpee Wampanoag Tribal Casino to move forward. Those obstacles included a renegotiated compact with the state, the lawsuit filed by KG Urban, the potential for a lawsuit because of the Commonwealth's equivalent to the 14th Amendment, and the fact that the tribal land has to be taken into trust. To date, only one of those concerns has been addressed, and the tribal state compact has not been approved by the legislature. The ability of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe to get land into trust continues to be a major concern for this particular casino. In part 9-1-2, the compact notes that the tribe presently holds no land in trust for Indian Gaming Regulatory Act gaming purposes or otherwise. And thus, the Commonwealth is under no legal obligation to commence negotiations to reach agreement on the compact. IGRA does not require a state to provide a tribe geographic ex exclusivity as to the proposed location for its gaming, the games it intends to offer, or on any other basis. The parties agree that IGRA negotiations need not be commenced or concluded until the tribe has land in trust that is qualified for gaming. Allowing any trust land to be created in Massachusetts has been permanently eliminated by the Supreme Court decision that Representative Casera mentioned, Caseri versus Salazar. The Secretary of the Interior does not have the authority to take land into trust for any tribe not recognized and under jurisdiction in 1934. And current federal law does not allow this tribe to have any land in trust. In Fletcher versus Peck, it is clear that there is no federally owned land in the Commonwealth and none can be created. In Hawaii versus Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the federal government may not remove land ceded to a state. Therefore, it remains unclear to me as to how the Mashpee Wampanoag will be able to clear the hurdles that Commissioner McHugh mentioned and that present themselves at the federal level and that their land will be granted in trust. I thank you for your careful consideration of these matters and future gaming decisions in Region C and your concern for strong economic future for all the cities and towns of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Um, I do have one comment on your, you, Representative Oral has been um, relentless on this important point and as we think about the various equities here there is a legitimate concern that the legislature the way it set up the licensing process was very respectful of the rights of surrounding communities uh, and gave the surrounding communities a substantial play in how their concerns can be mitigated uh, and gave them leverage in the negotiations and gave us leverage in making sure that they get uh, appropriate mitigation attended to and resources to do that up front, not out of the community mitigation fund that you referred to. That does not exist, uh, at least as at present, the way the plan is intended to go forward uh, with the travel casino. And you know, I think that is, you've been talking about this point for the better part of a year now, um, and I think it's a fair point and something that we do may, we need to remain attentive to, mindful of. And, and to emphasize, the community mitigation fund will be administered by the Massachusetts <coughs> Gaming Commission and that's where the concerns are regarding the surrounding communities because it's unclear 
how those funds will be distributed. Right. Is, is at the same time, the, the NEPA process, the, the uh, federal equivalent of, of the MEPA, our MEPA process, requires, does it not, some mitigation efforts uh, yes. involve, uh, regional studies that include the surrounding communities and uh, the potential for imposing on the tribe the obligation to pay for, uh, for mitigation and participation by the surrounding communities in identifying what the impacts will be. Is that, do I have that right? That is correct. And, and I believe that the concern with this particular casino is that these studies weren't done prior to the, this all happening. And so with commercial casinos, surrounding communities, the safeguards are put in place for surrounding communities. Right. Yeah. So this is kind right. of backwards. Right. It, it's not that under, right. the, under the tribal program, there is under the tribal option, mm -hmm. there are protections for surrounding communities. They come from the NEPA process, yes. But it is not the same level of protection. No, no, right. I, I wasn't suggesting yeah. that it was. I'm just, I just right. I'm trying to make sure that my understanding is correct and that the surrounding communities that you represent have been participants in that NEPA process. not. Uh, in your view, an ideal solution, but Correct. they have participated. Okay, they thank have. you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Alan Sylvia, thank you. From the seventh Bristol district. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the commission, uh, I too would like to welcome you to Fall River on this uh, snowy day, and let's hope uh, by the time you all leave, there's not three or four inches out there. President, President uh, Spraga said he had a lot of sleeping bags, just in case. Yeah, he does. He, he, I know he can accommodate you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, over the years, the residents of Fall River and the South Coast have strongly supported several valid initiatives favoring the establishment of casino gaming. And since the early 1980s, we have been told that a tribal casino was right around the corner. Therefore, it is incredibly disheartening and so incredibly unfair that while other regions of the Commonwealth finally get to benefit from <coughs> casino gaming, the one region pursuing it for 30 years has been pushed to the side and relegated to second-class status. The people I represent in Fall River the city of Fall River here in Region C, should not be disenfranchised and provided less opportunity than anyone else or any other region. When statewide legislation passes whereby citizens of the Commonwealth are treated differently because of where they reside, it doesn't require a lot of basic reasoning skills to know it's bad policy. The problem for everyone in our region, Region C, is that by the time the courts finally arrive at what is an obvious conclusion based on precedent, many years will pass. Gaming facilities in other areas of the Commonwealth will be well established and entrenched, generating millions of tax in tax revenue and creating thousands of jobs. Region C will still be told it's just around the corner. As a member of the legislature, the people who elected me are good, hardworking people. The problem they have is no work. As a matter of fact, the district that I represent, nearly 50,000 people in the city of Fall River, is one of the highest, has the highest unemployment rate in the Commonwealth. They need jobs. My district has that highest unemployment rate that I mentioned. I know casino gaming is not going to be the answer to all of our problems, but if you have a family and you're on the unemployment line with a limited skill set where English may be not your primary language, a job, any job, anywhere is God sent. Some of my colleagues are skeptical, are skeptical about casino gaming. The people struggling and out of work have uh, out of work, don't, don't really give a damn about political skepticism, nor do I. They want to work, and it's our job to create the economic conditions where they can find work. A commercial gaming license for Region C starts the process of creating 
the economic environment which creates jobs now. At a time in the Commonwealth where we are looking at cutting basic services to the truly needy and the governor is asking to raise taxes by $2 billion, why would anyone suggest that taxing one group less than 25 percent, that which every other commercial gaming entity has to pay the Commonwealth, is okay? It's not okay. It's wrong and basic common sense tells us so. Why should the taxpayers of Region C and frankly the entire Commonwealth financially subsidize and reward a multi-million dollar Malaysian gaming company? Moreover, the argument that you can't have two casinos, a commercial and someday a tribal, in the same region is complete nonsense. The gaming customer will patronize the facility with the best value, entertainment and experience. Since when have the citizens of the Commonwealth become afraid of a little competition? Maybe folks elsewhere up north uh, can't handle that, but here we love competition. We're not afraid. Mr. Chairman and members of, of the Commission, I respectfully ask you to please open Region C to a commercial gaming license process now and provide the people that I represent and the entire South Coast area that which has been provided to the rest of the Commonwealth, an equal process to pursue a gaming commercial gaming license and provide jobs for the people now. We need them now, and I, I thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Questions? Just one comment. I know you know this, but just out of clarity, uh, there, there is um, no state policy or state option or state intention to subsidize the tribe. If the tribe gets land and trust, it will have the right to conduct a certain category of gaming without paying anything to the state and that is their inherent and sovereign right under federal law. Uh, it's not a subsidy from the Commonwealth. I thank you, and I do realize that is the time issue here. Right. You know, we're, we're here in, in a community <clears throat> that was told 20 years ago we'd have a train. We've been told, tw and for 20 years we've talked about a casino. And you keep believing those guys. We do. <laughs> we, can, we keep believing, and, and someday, and I know it won't be in a year, but the, the, the ground has to break so that people here can work. And I, and I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Representative. <laughs> Representative Antonio Cabral from 3rd Bristol. Representative Cabral. <laughs> Tell him to hustle. How about uh, the Honorable, uh, how about Representative Sean O'Connell? I think I saw her here. Why don't you go ahead? Come ahead. Representative Sean O'Connell from 3rd Bristol. Thank you very much. And thank you for holding these hearings and for the opportunity to testify. I certainly appreciate it. And I will be very brief, two words that I know you like to hear. Um, at the hearing in December, the Commission delayed a decision on whether to open up the bidding process in order to give the tribe time to make adequate pro progress. And that was the right decision. The expanded Gaming Act, which a lot of my colleagues here voted for, um, recognizes and protects the federal rights of the tribe to conduct gaming in southeastern Massachusetts, and it is now our obligation to follow that law. Um, and the tribe continues to make process, progress and meet the requirements of that legislation in a timely manner, and they are on track to open their destination resort casino sooner than the commercial developers, as evidenced by all the work that has already been completed. Um, they are far ahead of the rest. They already have their referendum vote, as you know, in Taunton. Um, they had it in June 2012, and the casino was approved by a very large margin in Taunton, and I'm pleased to support the people of Taunton in that decision. And afterwards, the tribe worked closely with the community to address concerns, to have meetings, to visit people's homes, and find out what those concerns are and how to address them. NIGA has been um, completed with the City of Taunton and approved by our City Council. 
The tribe acquired options on land near the intersection of Route 24 and 140, and those parcels of land are now under active review, as you know, to become trust lands for the tribe, which will give them the right to conduct gaming on those lands. Designs for a facility um, have been made, and impact and environmental studies have been conducted. Um, and as we know, uh, the second compact has been made an agreement and will be voted on by the legislature very soon. So throughout this process, I think it is clear that the tribe continues to meet all their obligations in a timely manner. And in addition, the tribe has been actively involved in the community with local businesses and the surrounding areas as well, um, with businesses, organizations, and worthy causes. And we look forward to them being a good friend of the community in the surrounding areas and to building on that relationship. So we've already benefited from them being there. The economic benefits are numerous for t not only Taunton, but the surrounding communities as well. The construction will create 1,000 um, private sector jobs, which I think is very important to note, with a payroll of approximately $230 million. The casino will uh, employ over 2,500 people with good paying jobs, averaging about $35,000 a year with benefits that the tribe has committed to giving to their employees. The tribe is also committed to hiring people um, from Taunton, Taunton residents, and that there is a provision in the IGA that, that speaks to that issue. Local businesses will also benefit, not just in Taunton, but in the surrounding areas and in southeastern Massachusetts, as the casino will have to spend millions of dollars annually on goods and services. And the tribe has also committed to outsourcing locally whenever it is possible. I think it's also very important to note that this is going to be a destination resort with many attractions um, for families, a family water park, which I personally am very happy about, uh, <laughs> entertainment venue, shopping, and dining. And so it will revive tourism in southeastern Massachusetts and in the greater Taunton area as well. Um, this casino project is quickly going to provide badly needed jobs and economic stimulus to not only Taunton, but to the entire region as well. And, you know, I understand that some of my colleagues um, are interested in have a, having a casino in their district. Uh, however, I think if the shoe was on the other foot right now, their testimony would be quite different than it is. But I understand that they're fighting for their district, and they should be, as I'm fighting for mine. At this point in time, though, I think it's our responsibility and that we need to let the tribe continue to move forward in the process as required by the Expanding Gaming Act so that we ensure that we have one successful casino in Region C and in a timely manner as well. And I want to thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Thank Questions? You. Uh, it seems to me, Representative, that, that one of the things that divides you and your colleagues is not the desirability of the tribal casino, but how likely it is to arrive and how long we have to wait, all of us to figure out whether it's going to happen. On the last, on the second of those two uh, divisions, do you have an idea as to how long we should wait? Well, you know, I think that is up to the Gaming Commission, and we, we continue to see progress with the tribe. And as long as we continue to see progress, I think that we need to let that progress move forward. Um, you know, there may be a point in time when it is time to say, okay, we're not going to get it, and that might be the point at which the BIA says, we're not going to take their land and trust. But right now, I think it's premature in the, in the process to do that because we continue to see progress by the tribe. And as long as we're seeing progress by them, and they are already ahead of any other region in all the work that they've completed this far, um, I think we need to keep going forward. We, uh, again, I will, I will restate, we want one successful casino in this region. Uh, we don't want to end up with two, as far as I'm concerned. Why not? I'm not sure that the region could handle two casinos. Uh, I'd like to see one built, you know, see how that goes. <laughs> but, you know, we, we have a license for three casinos. I think we should stick with three casinos. Or right. legislation, I mean, for three casinos. Right. You said um, earlier that the legislature would be taking up the, the compact very soon. Do you have some knowledge about that? I do not have a date. Okay. I, I'm not sure I said very soon, but soon, yes. Um, okay. I imagine we will be taking it up soon. I do not have a date, though. Okay. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Cabral. Representative Antonio Cabral, 13th Bristol. Thank you. 
not to put pressure on you, but before the other members of the legislature leave, I just want to express my appreciation for your brevity. brevity. Every single one of you stuck to the time limit or less. I know not an easy task for somebody in your line of work, um, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, taking me out of turn. I apologize for being slightly late, but uh, this is uh, an extremely important meeting that I didn't want to miss. I have submitted copies of the letters that I submitted electronically to, uh, to the commission. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Members of the commission, thank you. And um, uh, I think it's, um, this is the second time I write to this commission, as you know, on this particular issue. And I believe not, now, two years after voting for the 2011 Massachusetts Expanded Gaming Act, in hopes that it would quickly create jobs in the Commonwealth, to urge the, com to urge the commission to act today to allow Region C potential bidders to join the request for application phase one, RFA one process currently underway in region A and B, and to consider proposals from across, com across Massachusetts equally going forward. I think it's important about having some regional equity here. As you know, the legislature crafted the Gaming Act to provide tribe eligible to pursue gaming under federal law, a very brief window to explore their opportunity or opportunities for casino development because we recognize the substantial hurdles any tribe would face in receiving federal approval to build a casino on non-tribal land. And because of the importance we place on ensuring that Region C not be held, not be left behind exploring casino development opportunities. Today, it is so unlikely that the sole remainder tribal applicant could justify the terms of the Gaming Act that it would be irresponsible to drag out this process any longer. As you know, the only possible candidate for a tribal casino under state law is actually a group of Malaysian investors called the Genting Group who, according to several media reports, are pursuing their hope of opening a casino in Massachusetts by financing the application of the, Mash of the Mashpee Wapanoag tribe. The United States Department of Interior has rejected the tribal compact signed by the Commonwealth last year. The department's reasoning for that rejection strongly suggests that they will reject the revised compact the governor has proposed as well. And if you go back to the original compact that was uh, negotiated on the governor wealth, and it was actually sent to be checked by the BIA, uh, the gov Governor Well did not even submit that proposal to us, or that compact to us to be approved because of the terms, which are very similar to the first compact and very similar to the second compact that was just negotiated by the governor. I believe the BIA will reject the second one. The, legis the legislature about it's about to begin its annual budget process. It could be many months before the legislature considers this revised compact. Even if, if it were to gain federal approval, even if the gaming group in the tribe were to jump all of those hurdles, the application would still face the greatest challenge of all. The requirement that the Department of the Interior take land into trust for the tribe. As Commissioner uh, noted on his December 4th, 2012 me memorandum to the Commission, Commission, thank you. Um, recent federal court decisions have made this applicants successfully taking land into trust even less likely, now that it was now that it was when we passed the gaming law. I'm talking about the ruling of the, of the Supreme Court that any abutter to the land could, can have, or will have up to six years to, uh, to you know, submit a lawsuit. Therefore, it is difficult to imagine how the tribe could be perceived as being close to receiving approval for a casino in Massachusetts. It is imperative that the commission move immediately to allow Regency to join the rest of the Commonwealth in the ongoing licensing process in order to ensure that the South that Southeastern Massachusetts benefit from the economic development the rest of the Commonwealth anticipates from casino development. 
We in Southeastern Massachusetts began this discussion of bringing casinos to Massachusetts more than two decades ago. The residents of my city, New Bedford, have twice voted to express their desire for casino development. We've had two referendums in the city of New Bedford that, pass, that passed um, with substantial overwhelming support. The Massachusetts legislature passed the Gaming Act because it expected that economic development would quickly follow. I urge the commission to act today to allow our region to join the rest of the Commonwealth and, invest, and investigate casino development opportunities. I think that's imperative. And that was the initial reason why we took up casino gaming. It was to allow economic investment, uh, both not only on Region A and B, but also Region C. I come from a city and represent a city that has the highest, the latest unemployment figures just came out several days back, the highest unemployment in the Commonwealth. We need and to let us stay behind or not keep pace with the, with the other regions in terms of this kind of investment. This is one of the most important one-time investments in a long time in the Commonwealth, potentially a billion dollar investment in any given region. And to let Southeastern Mass behind is unfair. Let the marketplace work. I believe in free enterprise. Let the marketplace. Everybody is concerned that we cannot support more than three casinos. Is it really the role of the commission to make sure we keep we keep and keep only and only have three casinos in Massachusetts? I don't believe it's necessarily the role of the commission. I think that's one of the desires of those who crafted the original legislation. But let the marketplace really determine that. At some point down the road, if the tribe can build a fourth casino. So be it. As long as in their sovereign land, I think they have their right. If we as a commonwealth don't collect a single revenue from that proposal, that's the right thing. Because they will, they will be building on a sovereign nation. Why should a sovereign nation pay to the state of Massachusetts if that was the case? But at that point, they're going to have to deal with the marketplace, free enterprise. And what are we, isn't that what we are? all about in this country, allow free enterprise to rule. Let it happen. If a fourth casino or a third casino uh, has that opportunity and can compete, let it be. What are we afraid of? Well, what I think what's important here is, is that we in Southeastern Mass should not be left behind from the rest of the state. We should follow the process at the same time accompany the other regions in order for us to have the same opportunity for that kind of investment that Region A and Region B has. I think it's unfair. I know the desires uh, are initially uh, the reasoning for. I respect uh, tribal rights. I think they have federal rights. And if they are successful 10 years from now, 15 years from now, then they have that ability to do so outside of the process of the Gaming Act. And they should pursue that and I certainly would support that as well. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Representative. Any questions for the representative? No. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Honorable William Flanagan, Mayor of Fall River. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Welcome, Your Honor. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, let me first uh, welcome you to the city of Fall River and say thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to give testimony at your hearing. And I would strongly urge this gaming commission to end the exclusive rights of the Mashpee Wampanoag in Regency. The longer the Mashpee Wampanoag have exclusivity to a gaming license here in Regency, the less likely there is a casino from opening here in this region. And let me tell you my thought process on that. Following the news reports, following these gaming commission hearings, reviewing the legislation that has been drafted, it appears that Region A is well on their way to getting up and running with opening a casino in that region. Out in Region B, you have Worcester, Springfield, Palmer. They're all on their way to having a casino open up in their region too. 
go 15 minutes to Lincoln, Rhode Island. The state of Rhode Island has passed a gaming bill. Twin Rivers will now have table games. Drive an hour to Mohegan Sun, to Foxwoods. You can go to probably two of the best casinos on the globe. You can get in an airplane and fly in less than an hour to Atlantic City or go off to Las Vegas, which is a destination location. So with all this opportunity that is already out there for gaming, either developing now or already here, the likelihood of a casino coming here to Regency dwindles every day that the Mashpee Wampanoag have exclusive rights. Now, the compact, I believe, will be passed by the legislature and I believe it's going to be adopted by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But I would ask that you take a look at that compact. Even though it doesn't really factor into your decision making, I believe it should. Because the compact, the way it's drafted, further prohibits, in my opinion, a casino from opening up in this region. If a commercial casino were to open in this region, the profits that the Mashpee Wampanoag would have to give back to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is zero. So it would be detrimental for this commission or for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to allow a commercial venture in this region. Because if they were to do so, the profit margin dwindles. Now another issue that you have to take up is regarding racinos, where to locate them. Under the compact, the opportunity for a racino to come to southeastern Massachusetts significantly is diminished also. Because if a racino were to open here, once again, the amount of profit the Mashpee Wampanoag would have to give back to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, once again, is decreased. So that compact is detrimental for gaming to occur in southeastern Massachusetts for anyone other than the Mashpee Wampanoag. And I wish the Mashpee Wampanoag well, I really do. We have a good relationship together, and I wish them nothing but the best. But they have some major hurdles that they have to overcome. One of them being the Salazar Kacheri decision. Are they going to be able to take land into trust? And if they're unable to do so, as the Supreme Court of the United States of America has indicated, then their casino is not going to be able to move forward because they're not going to be able to have sovereign land. Now, the longer they take to get a shovel in the ground, Boston's going to open up their doors. Western Massachusetts is going to open up their doors. Twin Rivers is going to have table games. Fox with Mohegan Sun already exist. Fall River and New Bedford have double-digit unemployment. The people of this region need to get back to work. And when I was an advocate for this gaming legislation, we advocated for this because it was a jobs bill. It was an opportunity to put people back to work. And this part of the region needs that opportunity. People from Forward and New Bedford and Taunton who worked in the mills and saw their jobs go overseas and they lost their job through no fault of their own want to get back to work. But the jobs simply are not here for them to get back to work. So I really urge this commission to open up the process to allow commercial applicants to submit applications. By doing so, you create competition, but you increase the likelihood of this region putting a shovel in the ground to construct a casino. And whether it's Taunton, Fall River, or New Bedford, wherever it may be, it has to happen here. Because if it does not happen here, the double-digit unemployment will continue to exist, and the people of this region will be left behind. So you have a huge decision to make. And to be quite honest with you, I don't envy uh, the decision you have to make. Uh, however, I urge you to make the right one. Because the decision you make will have a generational impact on this community. Future generations and their quality of their life will be determined by the vote you take here as commissioners. And I strongly urge you to make the right vote 
uh, in, in deciding and casting your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Lanigan. Questions for the mayor? Anybody? Thank, Thank you, you for allowing much. me to testify. I appreciate much. your time. The Honorable Tom Hoy, Mayor of Taunton. Nice to see you again, Your Honor. Chairman Crosby, members of the commission, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Approximately one year ago, the city of Taunton and the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe announced they were commencing discussions about the possibility of locating a casino development in our city that would bring much needed jobs, development, and economic opportunity. At that time, we knew that locating a tribal casino in Taunton would be difficult given the significant number of steps that had to be accomplished under Section 91 of the Massachusetts Expanded Gaming Act. <coughs> Section 91 of the Act granted the governor and the tribe until July 31st, 2012, only five months from when we initially commenced the discussion with the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe to secure all necessary land, enter into a mutually agreed upon compact, obtain a general court's approval of such a con compact, enter into an intergovernmental inter agreement between the tribe and our city, and obtain approval of both our city council and our residents by way of a referendum. Despite this tight time frame, through the efforts and hard work of the tribe, the members of my administration, and certainly the members of our Taunton City Council, and with the affirmation and overwhelming support of our residents, I am pleased and proud to report that all of these steps were accomplished on time in accordance with the act and in a true partnership with tribal leadership. Our, inter, our IGA, or intergovernmental agreement with the tribe, protects the city and its residents from actual and potential adverse effects and impacts from the casino project and requires the tribe to make substantial payments to the city in lieu of property taxes to the tune of over $8 million a year. Further, the IGA provides for local hiring and purchasing preferences requires that the tribe consult with the city on the project, siting and design, and calls for formation of an advisory committee that will allow community input on matters encompassed by our IGA. The tribe has fulfilled its promises made to the city of Taunton, including paying all the city's expenses incurred for its legal, mitigation, and other consultants, and have also made a $1.5 million payment to the city of Taunton. Since entering into the intergovernmental agreement, the tribe has continued to continued its efforts towards bringing casino development to fruition, including negotiating a new gaming compact with Governor Patrick with input from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, completing a draft of its environmental impact report required under the National Environmental Protection Act, and further developing and refining its architectural design and construction plans. Additionally, the tribe has taken significant steps towards having land on which the casino will be located being taken into trust by the U.S. Department of the Interior. As you know, it has been mentioned today, the land into trust process is complex and cumbersome. The tribe, however, is making substantial progress. By way of background, my legal advisors have informed me that in order for the tribe to conduct gaming on the land in Taunton, the tribe must satisfy two criteria, or two legal criteria. To have land deemed to be an initial reservation under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, or IGRA, and to have land taken into trust under the Indian Reorganization Act. The first criteria has been satisfied. On December 31st, 2012, the tribe received a letter from Kevin Washburn, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior, announcing that the land qualifies as an initial reservation under IGRA. With respect to the second criteria, Mr. Washburn's letter indicates that the Department of Interior is actively reviewing the tribe's application. In fact, just yesterday, the solicitor of the Interior confirmed in writing that the department had made positive land to trust determination in the aftermath of the Kasiri decision, and the Mashpee application has been given top priority. Once the tribe satisfies its second criteria, my legal advisors have advised that the process for land into trust becomes procedural in nature. Therefore, to my knowledge, there is nothing before the commission today that could reasonably be expected to lead the commission to conclude that the tribe will not have its land taken into trust by the U.S. Department of the Interior. As such, we respectfully request that this commission not commence the process of soliciting bids for commercial casinos in Region C. 
to open Region C now may have adverse and unintended consequences. First, we question whether any casino bidder would be willing to submit a proposal for a casino in Region C while the tribe is successfully continuing with its land and trust, especially that any casino bidder would be required to pay a non-refundable $400,000 application fee, but never have the opportunity to obtain a Category 1 license. Additionally, based on a newspaper article dated August 26, 2011, which the article comments on the introduction of the Massachusetts Legislature of the Gaming Expansion Bill, including the tribe's rights in Regency, we believe the legislator intended to grant the tribe exclusivity in Regency for so long as the tribe satisfied the requirements of Section 91 of the Act, which, as I stated earlier, it did. And so long as the tribe is successfully pursuing its land to trust application, which it is, we believe the legislature intended this exclusivity for two reasons. One, so that the Commonwealth could limit to three, the total number of resort style casinos in the state, and two, so that the Commonwealth could grant a meaningful concession to the tribe to support its payment of the portion of its gaming revenues to the Commonwealth under the Gaming Compact. Specifically with the legislation of the casinos in the Commonwealth, the legislature recognized that the tribe would be eligible to build a casino of its own without state approval using its authority under IGRA, pursuant to which the tribe could acquire land into trust and open a class two gaming facility without obtaining a state compact. If that were to happen, the legislature realized that there could be a possibility of a fourth resort casino in the Commonwealth, three commercials as well as the tribal casino, in the Commonwealth would not have any ability to receive payments from the tribe. We note that should the Commission determine to solicit bids from casino developers of Region C now, while the tribe continues to proceed with its land and trust application, and while it looks like such an application will be successful, this could ultimately result in the occurrence of the exact things the legislature was trying to protect against. That is, there could be two casinos, one tribal and one commercial, located here in Region C. And if there were two casinos in Regency, the tribe would to lose ex exclusivity in the region, the Commonwealth may not be able to provide su su sufficient meaningful concessions to the tribe in order to support the Commonwealth's receipt of payments from the tribe under the compact. In fact, it is evidenced by the language in the re revised compact. The revised compact provides that if there is another resort casino in Regency, the tribe makes no payments to the Commonwealth. As an aside, my consultants tell me that if there were two resort casinos in Regency, the Com Commonwealth's revenues would be less than expected to be received under the revised compact because the doubt, they doubt the region can support two resort casinos, a travel casino and a commercial casino. Based on the forthgoing, we believe it would be unreasonable and unjust to all parties, the tribe, the city of Taunton, and even to prospective Regency commercial casino bid bidders if the casino were to open Regency now. If in the future different facts should come to light leading the commission to de determine that the tribe's land will not be taken into trust, we respectfully submit at such time the commission may revisit this policy this decision. And I certainly thank you for your time here this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. You're very welcome. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you're the second person uh, today to talk about the letter from the solicitor. Do you have a co the solicitor uh, uh, saying that uh, we can certainly get, uh, forward you a copy of that letter. I don't have it. Okay. What, what were the hand? words? I was going to ask that too. What were the words that you quoted from the solicitor? That he confirmed in writing that the department has made positive fee to trust determinations in the aftermath of the Kasseri decision and the Mashpee's application has top priority. I believe the chairman has a copy of it right here that I could certainly share with you. Okay. Great. That would okay. be helpful. You also talked about a newspaper article in uh, sometime in 2011 that said something about exclusivity, what was that? I could certainly forward that to you as well, but it, it talked about the legislature intended to grant the tribe exclusivity in Regency as so long as the tribe satisfied its requirements under Section 91 <clears throat> of the Act, which, which it did, and so long as pursuing the land into trust, which, which it certainly is. And I, and I think, you know, we certainly understand, you know, I un understand the testimony from, you know, the area legislators, uh, Mayor Flanagan. I mean, we, everybody wants to see a resort-style casino in, in this region, especially because we are a an area of manufacturing. Uh, you know, this area was built on manufacturing, and those jobs simply do not exist anymore. And this, 
this uh, cas resort casino opportunity will go a long way in creating economic opportunity. But it is certainly my belief that, as a matter of fact, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe is, is much further along than any of the uh, commercial interests in, in any region of the state at this point. So I, I think uh, to kind of stop that process right now, you know, would be a mistake for this region, and I, I sincerely believe that. Well, as you know, there's there's considerable uh, difference of opinion about Correct. whether there is exclusivity in that act or not in the way you describe it. And a newspaper article isn't going to be dispositive, but I'd still be interested in seeing. Sure, I'll get you. I can get you a copy. Right. Certainly, get you a okay. copy of that. We can forward it up. Anything Any? else for the mayor? No, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Again, thank you all very much for your time here today. Take a break. Yeah, we're going to take a uh, brief break, and we will thank be you. back as close to five minutes from now as possible.